if you were to boil all the issues of concentration practice down to the most basic of the issues, you get down to the question of when to stay in place and when to move. And when you're going to stay in place, how do you do it? How do you get the mind to settle in? And when you move, how do you do it in a way that doesn't obscure things? In other words, there are times when you simply want to stay with one object and get everything to settle down around that object. And other times when you want to question, look into something. Allow some thoughts to come into the mind and then see where they go, so you can understand the process. The principle applies to the body, too. When you're sitting in meditation, there are times when pain comes up. How do you know when to stay with the pain, and how do you know when it's time to move? And part of that lies in learning how to use the breath. When we're working with the breath here, it's like doing body work. And there are basically two kinds of body work. The more aggressive style just tries to straighten you out, pulls you here, bends you there, forces the body into a better alignment. And the other style is a little bit more indirect. Just placing the body in a particular position where it will naturally release, relax. Relax into alignment rather than being forced into alignment. And when you're working with the breath, it's primarily that second approach that you're trying to do here. You want your posture to be straight, you want your organs of the body not to be piled on top of one another or squunch up against one another. But if you try too hard to straighten things out, you can actually damage yourself. Remember, we're working with breath energy here. As John Fuing used to say again and again, this is, the, this is the key to our skill here, is learning to distinguish the breath energy from the other properties of the body, and to work primarily with the breath. Now, the breath is subtle. Sometimes we feel that we can suck it into a little sack in the body and then squeeze it back out. Well, that's the air. That's not the breath. The breath is the energy flow, and it doesn't have any clear edges. There's no clearly demarked area where this is the breath and this is not the breath. There's actually breath energy suffusing everything in the body, and it can flow unimpeded. It's the liquid that gets impeded by the solid parts, but the breath can go anywhere. And so when the alignment of the body doesn't seem quite right, think of this totally unbounded energy. Unbounded in the sense that there's no space boundaries. You can go anywhere, do anything. and allow that to realign things, so you're not pushing and pulling, because sometimes, as I said, the pushing and pulling can do some damage. Simply opening and allowing. And once you're there with that kind of energy, it's a lot easier for the mind to settle down in a way that doesn't require a lot of effort, a lot of exertion. This is one of the problems of reading the text too much, as we get lots of preconceived ideas of what the mind should be doing, what phases it should be going into. And then we try to squeeze it in. And you can squeeze it in for a while, but after a while you run out of energy. And if you think of anything that's been squeezed into a confining place, it gets all distorted, which is not what you want.
You work on the causes and let the effects take care of themselves. In terms of the concentration, the causes are three. You direct your thoughts to the breath, you evaluate the breath, and you try to stay with the breath as your single preoccupation. That's all you have to worry about. Now, sometimes you'll find that your conception of the breath gets confused. I said earlier, there's a tendency to confuse the breath energy with the liquid energy in the body. When the liquid runs up against obstacles, it can't go. It gets squeezed in. But the breath doesn't have to be squeezed in. But we start breathing as if it were, and that creates problems. So remember, it's totally free to go anywhere at all, all the time. And the neat boundaries we place around it are artificial. So learn to erase them and see what happens. And as for the pleasure we want or the, the rapture we want, that'll happen on its own. You can squeeze it, you can force it, but it's not going to last very long. It's like squeezing a fruit to make it ripe. You know, the fruit's supposed to be soft, and so you squeeze it and squeeze it and squeeze it until it's soft. But that doesn't ripen it. You just get mush. You water the soil, you make sure there are no ants and other insects that are going to eat your fruit. Give the tree some fertilizer. In other words, you put a lot of your attention on the roots, and then the fruits take care of themselves. And for the time being, you don't want to go anywhere else. This is where the principle of staying comes in. We're creating a state of becoming here, a state of mind. And as the Buddha said, it requires a desire. That's the basic seed around which everything else grows. The seed has to be located in a certain place. So we're locating things in the breath, locating things here in the body, here in the present moment. And our desire is to stay here. And in doing so, we learn a lot about the process of becoming, how the mind creates these worlds. By creating a world that has reference to the present and is still, that enables us to see the other worlds as they begin to form. And we realize we have the choice to go with them or not. All too often the choice is almost automatic. A thought comes up and you jump right in and right off without looking to see who's driving, where they're planning to go. And so one of the important skills in the meditation is learning how not to move along with the thoughts. A thought will come out and you don't have to get involved. You stay right here with the breath. And when you can make that separation, you see that the thoughts shoot out for a little ways and then just fall. Like that story of the, the hill tribesmen in Thailand who had fallen in love with the queen who had come up from the central plains in the city of Lampun. She had established a kingdom. He sent his emissaries to propose marriage. And there were little scrawny hill tribesmen. And she said, What does your chief look like? And they said, Well, it looks just like us. And she wasn't interested. But then he proposed to them that he would stand on his mountain, which was 30, 40 miles away, and throw a spear. And if the spear landed in the city, she would be his wife. So she figured there's no way he's going to get the spear that far. So she agreed. And so he did his magical chants, and he threw a spear, and it almost got into the city. So this is when she became concerned. So she created a hat for him out of her clothing. She put her own charm on it and then sent it to him. And he thought, well, it's a sign of she's changed her mind. So he put the hat on. And then the next spear, he tried to do his magical chants, and the spear just went up in the air and just came right down. It didn't go anywhere at all. And so most of our thoughts have magical power because we give them the magical power that allows them to go miles and miles and miles. We jump right in and we keep them going. 
And one of the skills we're learning, however, here is to deprive them of their magical power. To see that they're simply constructs. And if you don't jump in with them and if you're not maintaining them, they don't go very far. So the big issues in concentration are how to get the mind into a position and how to keep it there. At the same time, allowing it to see, because there are types of concentration where you just blank out. And although you're still, you're not learning anything. The whole point of this is to put you in a position where the mind is still and clear. It can see things. Whatever's going to move, you can see it, but you're not moving along with it. Unless you see that it is an important thought, something you really got to think through. Okay, then you say, okay, now we're going to move with this, we're going to go with it. And when we've finished our work with it, we come back here. So it's not that we shut the mind down totally and leave it there. As the Buddha said, when you gain full control over your thoughts, it means you can think when you want to think, and you don't have to think when you don't want to think. You've got the choice, instead of just willy-nilly, running along with whatever happens whatever comes up in the mind. You're in a position where you can see some things are worth thinking and a lot of things are not. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha has us learn how to question our assumptions, because it's our assumptions that pull us into a lot of thoughts. And why he teaches so much about questioning. One of the main lessons he teaches is that there are some questions that are simply not worth worth answering because the dichotomies they set up are are false. Either because the issue itself is just a non-issue, or because there are more alternatives than just the two. So when the Buddha talks about gaining insight through investigation, this is part of it, learning what is this process of questioning. When you set up a question, how are you predetermining the answer? And you learn how to step outside of the questions. There's that famous exchange that John Cha had when someone who asked him about what happens to someone who goes to nirvana. Do they still exist? Do they not exist? So he tried to explain that this was these the alternatives were false. And give the image of the candle. When the candle's burning, you can talk about the flame. When it's not burning, you can't talk about the flame anymore. So he asked her if that satisfied her, and she said no. She wasn't satisfied with his answer. He said, well, in that case, I'm not satisfied with your question. Which in one way is startling, because usually it's the person who asks the question who's got the power to say, okay, this answer satisfies me and this one doesn't. And this is how the mind traps itself. It sets up questions, sets up dichotomies. They keep it trapped. So one of your skills want to develop as a meditator is to learn which questions are worth running with and which ones are not, because the questions have a huge shaping influence on the rest of your thoughts. And it turns out that ultimately this dichotomy between moving and staying still, that turns out to be a false dichotomy too. Because there comes a point when the mind is fully trained in learning how to stay still. that it realizes the one issue that's remaining is its attachment to staying still. But you don't want to go on off, run off moving either, so you're trapped, as long as you see that those are the only alternatives. As long as you're seeing things in mind states that have a location, like your state of becoming, centered around that particular desire, that particular intention. And all of our choices up to this point have simply been, are you going to stay with this intention or are you going to move to another intention? That's getting the mind still enough and sharp enough 
to see that there's an alternative, another alternative. This is why the Buddha said in the, the dimension where suffering ends. There's no coming, there's no going, and no staying in place. Or when that Deva asked him when I crossed the stream, and he said he crossed by neither moving forward nor staying in place. No, he left it at that. Didn't explain. Because he wanted the Deva to realize that there's more to the mind than what the Deva had presupposed. And that's one of the questions that hovers over the practice as you get closer and closer to gaining real insight. What are the alternatives aside from moving and staying in place? John Lee once said we have this tendency to see the big issues as the big abstractions, all the technical vocabulary, that that's high-level drama. And the simple business of simply learning how to keep the mind still is low-level drama. He said, that's wrong. Got it all backwards. Looking at the basics again and again and again. That's, that's where the real work gets done. To learn how to get really good at staying in place, getting the mind unified, settled in. So you begin to understand the subtle differences between moving and staying in place, the various ways in which the mind moves, the various ways it can stay in place. So that ultimately you can see what that other alternative is. And that's a lot of the practice right there. 